Welcome, one and all. We're in Isaiah chapter 7. My name is Pete Boyd, associate pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Jessup, Georgia, where we actually had a third season today. We had fall. Today is Saturday. I'm filming this on a Saturday night. And it's been a beautiful week and an even better day today. So I hope today and when this lesson, when you tune in, whether it be Saturday night or Sunday or during the week next week, I pray that you're doing well. We're titled this message today, When the Wind Whistles. And my friend, the wind does whistle. And we're going to find out what that means. We're going to find out what your role is in, in the wind and what God does in the wind. It's going to be encouraging, I hope, today. Whether you're lost or saved, there's a word for you. So before we get going, let's pray to God for him to open up our eyes and hearts to his Holy Spirit, what his Spirit has for us to say. Dear Lord, this word that we are reading happened over two and a half thousand years ago. Every word has come true or will come true. So we come to you tonight with that mindset. This is your word for yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for being the God that you are. And I ask, Father God, that you will help me to speak well. Help me, dear Lord, to be passionate. Help me, dear Lord, to be precise. Help me to be pithy so people can tune in and tune out, Father God. Get what they got to get for this week. And put it in their tool belt. But Lord God, it's, it's not what I say. It's not, it's not how I organize it. Oh, no. Is how your spirit delivers it and impacts our hearts. So, dear Lord, I start with me. And we'll finish with everybody who watches. May we return to you the glory that you deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we're going over five things in Isaiah chapter 7. If you have not read the chapter yet, please do so right now. Press pause. We'll be on the other side of the pause button. Now that you have read the whole chapter, let's go over some highlights here. Five things. Your book stretches verses 7 through 17. I want to go over all of it. So let's, let's go over five facts. First fact is this here. The wind does whistle. And what I mean by that is, you pick up in verse 2. Verse 1 talks about how Judah, led by King Ahaz, who was an evil man, how he is up against the wall. He has two different kingdoms that are coming against him. And they're threatening to remove him from the throne and put a patsy on the throne that will do ball with them. Because... Ahaz actually has grown a little bit of manhood, and he's standing up to these people. But we get this phrase where the wind whistles from verse 2. And it was told the house of David, saying that Syria is confederate with Ephraim. That means that they're allies. And his heart, as Ahaz, his heart was moved. And the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved by the wind. So here comes a strong wind, and these trees are swaying, because it's a strong wind. And these trees go high. And there are many of them, and everybody's upset. Everybody's scared to death. Everybody's worried. Why? Look at this map here. I know many of y'all don't like history, but I got to go with just a little bit of history in Isaiah chapter 7. Judah is led by King Ahaz. Judah, if you can see over here on your, on your screen, Judah is that small territory in green. She has been separate from Israel for many years. Israel is called Ephraim in your Bible. Sometimes it's called Samaria. Those are the northern tribes. They're led by King Pekah at the time, who was not... Uh, who was not a righteous man himself. Syria was led by a guy by the name of King Rezin, and then we have the superpower. This is the empire that's about to be the dominant empire in the Middle East, even greater than Egypt and all of these many empires that are coming that are coming and go, going in what we call Mesopotamia. But King Assyria, led by Tiglath-Pileser. Assyria is threatening Syria. And for Syria to defeat us, Syria, she needs help. So Israel and Syria are joining together to stave off future advancement of Assyria. And they want Judah to play ball. And Ahaz says no. Because when these two kingdoms are told no, they're going to march on Judah and threaten to take Ahaz off the throne. Now, you need to read 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28. It's going to give you a lot more details about these two men, what happens to them, as well as King Ahaz. We're not going to go over that tonight, so make sure you read that during your quiet time this week. Gives you a little bit more of what happened to Ahaz after Isaiah 7 goes down. So he's in a dilemma here because the king is going to get a head chopped off, and they're going to replace a son of David with a man from another house. And that's why the wind was whistling, and the king was very upset because his life was in danger. I ask you this question here. Let's put you in the story. What type of winds whistle in your life? For Ahaz, it was about his empire, it was about his kingdom, it was about his rule, it was about his head, it was about his posterity. 
So he had, he had a lot riding on the Lord stepping in to help him out. Now, of course, he did not want the Lord to step in and help him out, but we'll get into that very, very soon. But maybe the win in your life is different. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe you're having some problems in your relationships. We have a lot of people that we know are impacted by relationships that are falling apart. And it's hard on them. It's hard on them mentally, especially when there's nobody around. Their thoughts are there. And demonic spirits vex them with these thoughts. And maybe it's people dealing with guilt. People dealing with issues, that bitterness they haven't dealt with in the past. There are many types of wins. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's dealing with your career. All areas of your life come under attack sometimes. The winds do blow, and there are many types of winds. So we ask you this question. Who causes winds to whistle? Now, I know Ahaz was an evil, evil man, but started chapter 7, this was not his fault. He kind of inherited this problem that plagued his father as well, who his father who was a good, good man. But sometimes winds come in your life because you caused them. Sometimes winds are brought to you because of other people. And sometimes winds come because God sends them. So whatever wind you're facing today, you need to know who's causing this wind. If it's you, you need to repent. Get right with, with the Lord. Do winds whistle in the lives of the lost only? And Ahaz, who was leading people down a bad path in terms of their faith, it's not just Ahaz who was evil, but the people that Judah was because of his, mainly through his leadership. Well, do winds only come to the lost people? I think about what Jesus said about how there was a wise man who built his house on the rock and a, and a very foolish man who built his house on the sand. What's common in both of those, those stories here or both, both of those examples that Jesus gave? The storms came. Storms and winds just don't come to the lost. They come to the saved as well. Nobody is immune from the winds. Nobody is. Big question is this here. When, not if, <laughs> but when the winds whistle, who do you seek or what do you seek? That says a lot about who your God is. Who do you go to? Ahaz did not go to Jehovah God because it was not his God. Isaiah called God my God, not our, our God. Ahaz did not turn to Jehovah God. Who do you turn to? If you're turning to a friend, to somebody who's got security, to the government, to your job, whatever it is, that's not good enough. Yeah, they may help you out in a certain instance or two, but in the end, only Jehovah God can change your life. Only Jehovah God can. So those, those are some very good questions there, I think, for that part. Number two, not only do the wind does whistle, but let's go over this one. The sovereign does speak. Here's Ahaz with some serious problems, yet he never goes to the Lord. But guess what? Key here is that Jehovah God comes to him. If you look in verse 3, it says, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. And it says, And say unto him, God spoke to Ahaz, even though he wasn't asked to. Now, when God spoke, what did he send? Number one, he sent a person. You know, in the life of every person, God has sent a messenger many times, several messengers to them to give them a word of encouragement. In this case, Ahaz had Isaiah. Now, he didn't ask for Isaiah. Isaiah came to him. But I'm telling you, if you're thinking and you're looking and you're in retrospect thinking about your past times where winds came, God sends people in your life to help you. Not only did he send a person, he sent a place. If you notice in, in that verse, that passage on that last screen, God told Isaiah specifically where to go to meet Ahaz. Ahaz was worried about the water supply. If there, there's a siege, what's going to happen here? Do we have, is everything souped up where we can withstand for a long, long time if there is some type of, mm, I forgot that word, it's slipping my mind but where they have surrounded the city. Can they live off that well? And so God sends them to a specific place. Why? Because God knows every little detail. God will meet you where you are in your life. He has met me many times in my life, depending on my age and where I was in my, in my fellowship with him. God sent himself. He sent servants to me to my door to get me to go to church. He sent me Sunday school teachers and preachers and just wonderful people and influences in my life and then when i would drift away from from the lord god many times sent certain people but he always met me always knew where i was and he always had the right word to say and he sends us more than just a person to a place he also sends us a proclamation 
he gets down into Chinatown here and he tells Ahab some things that he needs to know. God will proclaim himself. But my friend, a lot of people think, boy, I, I wish God could somehow speak to me directly. Well, I'll be honest with you. What, what you have now is far be better. You have the Word of God. The Holy Bible can address any situation you're in today. God sends you His person. God send, sends you to the place you're at. He knows where you are, but He also gives you a right word. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've gone to the Word of God. Sometimes it was first time. Sometimes it was a last resort. But I always got something out of God's Word when I, when I sought His, His truth. He always is there to make a proclamation of some sort. And God does give you a promise. God just doesn't give you a word. He gives you sort of truth and proof that he can do it. Now, you need to come up with stories in your life where God has stepped in. I'm not going to go through you and tell you the hundreds of times that God has stepped in and given me a promise to his word. That's something that you need to develop on your own. It really doesn't do you any good when you're going through a storm, through a wind, a series of winds that are blowing the treetops off in your life. Well, I know God did a great thing for Pete. No, no, no. You, you need to have this. God has done great things in my life. And that's where we need to get to, not just always depending upon stories that we heard about God helping somebody else. What about, what about us creating stories and writing stories now? God has helped me in this situation. Oh, the Lord is still busy, guys. He still speaks. What did Ahaz do for the Lord to deserve this? Absolutely nothing. The Lord saw Ahaz, and this guy was an evil man. Some people think he's the most evil king they had in Judah. The Lord sought him because the Lord loved Ahaz. And he would do the same for you. I don't care if you're saved or not. God will speak to you. Speaking through his word, speaking through me right now and other people in your life that have shared you, with you God's truth. But God speaks to the lost. He speaks to the saved. It's on a different platform. It's a different relationship. But if you're lost, God is speaking to you to be saved. If you're saved, God's speaking to you. Trust him. Get in the book and trust him. So Ahaz did nothing for the Lord to come to him. Will the Lord speak to someone like me? Ahaz was an evil man. Let me tell you what Ahaz did. Ahaz is far worse than you are. But because of sin in your life, you're on the same, same le level, though, which may shock you. Ahaz brought in false worship into Jerusalem. And he took the worship of Jehovah God and brought in the worship of gods like Baal and others. And he kind of mixed the religions together. He put them on the same plane. And then eventually, because of his rejection of God, you know what he did? He took furniture, a piece of furniture, and marred the, the furniture to suit the worship of the false god, where he took out things of the temple, took out gold and silver and treasure, sent them off to Assyria, and he marred and scarred and destroyed some of the furniture that was built all the way, all the way back to Solomon's day. And he eventually closed the temple. People could not worship Jehovah God at all. He offered sacrifices of his own sons. He offered, he killed one of his own sons, if not more, to a false god. Ahaz was a wicked man. He's in hell today. And if the Lord will speak to him, he will speak to you. But, like I mentioned before, you may not have killed your kid to a false god. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you have sin in your life. And it doesn't take bad sins to send you to hell. It only takes one. And all of us have fallen short of God's glory. When the Lord speaks, what are we to do? I'm glad you asked that. Look at verse 4. First thing, take heed. What does that mean? Open your ears. How many times do we go to God and we're not willing to listen? Anytime you're seeking God, you should have an open heart. When you walk through any church you're going to, hopefully it's Calvary Baptist Church. We've got plenty of room. Come on. 1030 tomorrow. Come ready to listen. To listen to God's Spirit. He will speak to you. But not only should you open your ears, you should close your mouth. How many times do we have a conversation? I need help. Somebody help me. And then you, you call them up. You don't ask for any advice. You just yap your trap. You tell them all the bad things that are going on in your life and what you're thinking here and there. It's, it's one thing to open your ears, but you also got to shut your mouth. When we communicate with God, there are times where we just need to chill and just listen. But not only that, you should give your heart. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. 
There is no possible way for you to say, God, you have my heart, and you be a worrisome person. It's not possible. It's not possible. You're not going to be anxious. You're not going to be a worry wart when you have your heart and said, God, my heart is your, your heart. I try to trust you. Worry and anxiety will go away. That's what we should do when the Lord speaks. Open our ears, close our mouths, and give our heart. And God will do mighty things in us and through us. Number three, believing does bless. This is one of my favorite. <laughs> I love this. I know many of you like verse 414, the most out of chapter 7. I like this verse my, myself. He's saying that God says, I'm going to step in. I'm going to help you out. Because of David's sake, not because of yours. But Ahaz has told you you're going to live, at least during this time period. And I'm going to take care of those two guys coming to kill you. And this is what he says. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. He tells Ahaz, I'm going to do, do this whether you believe or not. But if you don't believe it, you won't be on the throne long. Now, I know that probably, you probably say, well, that has nothing to do with me to, today at all. Yes, it does. When God speaks clearly, and your heart knows it, and you don't believe him, God shuts off blessings. He removes his hand. I'm not saying if you're saved, I believe you're always saved, if saved, to start off with. But that relationship can be, I'm going to say squandered. It, it, can, be, it can be grieved. It can be quenched. Where God is distant from you. He's not removing himself from you, but he is distant. Because God doesn't get mixed up with, with sin. And when you refuse to believe God for his word, that is unbelief. That is probably the, the greatest sin of all. If faith is the greatest thing that we can do is trust him and his son, then we have to say the opposite is the worst, right? And he told this boy, he said, look, if you don't believe, believe me, you won't be around, around long. And he says the same thing to us. Think about John chapter 3. We all know John 3, 16. But I love this last part here, verse 18. He that believes on Jesus is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. What do you have to do to reject God? Absolutely nothing. Just keep living your life the way you are. If you want to go to hell, you don't have to do anything special. Just keep not trusting Christ. And if we say this, if you will not believe, you will not be established. We have to say that the opposite is true. If you do believe, you will be established. Believing does bless. I'm telling you, the whole book is filled with this stuff. When the Lord has spoken in your life, have you fully believed? We've got a lot of people who said a prayer when they were young or when they went to revival years ago or because their friends went down front, they did as well. Have you truly believed the Lord for everything that he says with you, all of your heart? If not, you are not saved. You're in the same boat Ahaz was in, and you're not going to make it. Another question. When the Lord has spoken and you believe, has he ever not blessed you? I'm 46. I've been saved since I was seven. I can never think of a time where I haven't been blessed when I believed. That's almost 40 years of experience there. He hasn't done it to me. Since Ahaz refused to believe what happened to him, Ahaz gets worse. I mentioned to you before what type of person he was and the bad things that he, he did. Ahaz, after this episode takes place, you know, the throne is saved because, not for Ahaz's sake, but for David's sake. And you read that in this chapter as well. But Ahaz is going to lose hundreds of thousands of people in death and to slavery. slavery. Now, the slavery doesn't last long. If you read 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28, you know that these two kings do come. Now, they don't conquer Judah. They don't conquer Jerusalem. But they pick away at his territory. And eventually, Ahaz rejects God, and he says, King of Assyria, I want you to help me out. He empties the treasuries of the house of the Lord first. He quits giving his tithe first. In other words, there was a money crunch. He loses money from his own, his own household. And he becomes a vassal. He becomes basically a stooge for the king of Assyria. And the Bible reads that he trusted the king of Assyria and he did not help him. He ends up losing not only his soul, but before he loses his soul in hell, he loses his empire, loses his kingdom. Loses his dignity. He loses so many things because he reject Christ. He rejects Jehovah God's word. Now, this is what you like. The promise does provide. What promise are we talking about? Now, if you read through this passage, he says, Ahaz, ask for a sign. 
whether it's in heaven or in Sheol or in hell, the grave, wherever you want to call it. I will give you a sign if you ask for one. And Ahaz says, well, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. He sounds dignified and pious. But what it is, Ahaz already has his mind made up. He doesn't care what Jehovah God says. He doesn't care about any, any signs. He knows he's going to the king of Assyria for help. It's a done deal. And I love in this passage that when he says, all right, you don't want a sign? I'm going to give you a sign, boy. But he, he quits talking to Ahaz. He starts talking about the house of David. He doesn't talk about Ahaz anymore. Ahaz says, no, I'm done. I, I'm good. God says, okay, that's fine. But I'm going to show all y'all a son, a promise. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Y'all know all this, especially if you've been in church for any length of time, especially around Christmas time, right? But Jehovah God says, I'm going to give y'all the kingdom, the house of David. I'm going to give y'all a son. Ahaz doesn't want a son. Okay, well, forget him. I'm going to give y'all a son. A virgin will conceive and give birth, and we'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. God will be with you. Salvation has come. Now, we know that it's talking about Jesus 700 years later. But the people in this day have no idea. Now, some commentators will say that this virgin was a woman who at the time was a virgin. And by the time that the, the rest of these verses are fulfilled, she gets married, maybe to Isaiah, we don't know. But this virgin girl gets married, she has, has a son, and she calls him that. Now, we don't have record of that. Some commentators say that this was not only fulfilled literally, but also prophetically down there in the line with Jesus. Now, we're not saying that another woman has been a virgin given birth. We're not, not saying that. We're just saying that she was a virgin at the time Isaiah said this. But I personally think God just mixed in the future with today. And he did, Jesus did this in the Gospels. You go to Matthew 24. Oh, my goodness. You go to Luke. What was it? Luke that we read last week. Luke 18, 18 or 17. Jesus is talking about the end times. And he, we don't know if he's talking about the rapture, the second coming, and all that in between. He mixes it all, all up in there. Not to confuse us, but to get us to search, to dig in his word. And I think God did this here, too. He gave us a little bit of the future plus today. He kind of shifts gears back and forth. But he did provide a promise, my, my friend. That promise is Jesus. So let me ask you this. Is Emmanuel with you today? <laughs> or is it just at Christmas time? Mm. Hope he's with you today. If not, he doesn't come to bless you. He comes to damn you. And the last part is the message does materialize. I'm not going to get into the history books and go from 16 all the way down to the end of the chapter, giving you a history lesson. If you really love this stuff, read it on your own. I'm just giving you a brief overview of this chapter. But all the things that God prophesied in this chapter did materialize, which means that it did come true. It did come true. And these are here some headlines based on the rest of the chapter. But we're talking about, if you go through and read the chapter, or if you have a commentary, read through all this. All of these things do happen where the Assyrians will come and they will take out Ephraim, Israel. They will take out Syria. Rezin and Pekah will both be killed. That happened. Assyria will eventually ha have a war with Egypt. That did happen later in time. A virgin did give birth, whether it's Jesus or somebody back in that day. It's both, both the same. Assyria will come and conquer Israel in 722. Briars will replace the vineyards. This is talking about Judah here. The last part of the chapter talks about, in, before this thing is all over, where Judah will be poor. Just like that son that the virgin would give birth. Or maybe he was talking about Isaiah's son. Now, that, that's something else to think about. After he talks about a virgin will give birth, he talks about a boy will eat butter and honey and all, all this stuff. He may be talking about Isaiah's son who, who was with him when he met Ahaz. I mean, we weren't there, we don't know. But we do know this. Everything that that chapter said has been fulfilled. <laughs> it's gone down because Judah became a wasteland. Wasteland. Beautiful vineyards and farming, all that stuff is gone. And people had to eat off the land like nomads again. Why? Because of sin. So let's ask you this question. So here's the last one, I think. What makes anyone think? Oh, yeah, this is the last question. This is good. What makes any person think? Isaiah 7 came true, every single verse. What would make anybody else think that the rest of the Bible that hasn't been fulfilled yet is not going to happen? If Isaiah's been fulfilled to the T, you know the rest of the prophecies are going to happen. Oh, well, Isaiah's a great book. 
Hey, this is our third lesson. We're only in chapter seven. We got almost 60 more chapters to go. I'm going to skip around a whole bunch more. But I hope this helped you in some way. I know this is a little different out, outline for chapter seven than you may read, but that's what the Lord shared with me for myself and also to share with you. So I, I pray that this encourages you and challenges you in, in some, some way. Jesus is coming back. The virgin did give birth. His name is Emmanuel. He is with us because he lives in us through his spirit. I pray you're saved. If not, you come by church. You give us a call. You put something in the comment section. Say, Pete, what do I got to do to be saved? We will share with you how to be saved. Hopefully, I'll see you all tomorrow at church. Let's pray this out. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful week, this beautiful night. Thank you for the great chance that I have to share. To be able to teach about Isaiah chapter 7. Lord, it's blessed my soul. It's given me more ammunition to put into my gunpowder pelt, my little bag of gunpowder that I'm going to take out one day and fire it away. Oh, Lord, you, you keep giving me stuff. Why? Because I seek your word. And anybody who's watching and listening, the same thing can happen in them and through them. Because, God, you're not just the God of Isaiah. You're just not the God of preachers. You are the God of people who trust your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray for every person watching it that they are saved. If not, that they will get right with you. And pray that those people who are saved, dear Lord, that they will check themselves before they wreck themselves. And I pray that when the winds whistle, we know what to do. We know that you will speak. That sovereign God, you will speak. And it's our job to listen. It's our job to shut up. It's our job, Father God, to give you our heart. And I pray that people do that. Lord, I thank you and I love you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for now. Goodbye.